Cordelia Brown was born in 1854. When she was 18, she moved to California where she met her husband, Welcome Botkin. No, your speakers didn't just glitch. His real name was Welcome, which I kind of love. Do you think his brother's name was like Salutations or something? Anyway, Welcome and Cordelia got hitched, had one son together, and were, you know, living that hashtag married life. Well, not quite. So this one time, Cordelia is at the park when she notices this studly dude riding by on a bike. Cordelia decides that she has to have him, so she just approaches him, strikes up a combo, and the two end up hitting it off. Which can I just say, what a method. Usually when I have a crush on someone, all I do is go up to them and I'm like, hey, how are you? And they're like, I'm good, how are you? And I'm like, good, how are you? I'm like, Allie, you just said that. Okay, so John Preston Dunning, despite being nine years younger than the now 41-year-old Cordelia, and despite the fact that they were both married, was like, yes, absolutely, let's have an affair. Okay, I feel like it's important to add here that in all the records kept of her, they describe her as frumpy and old age. But listen, Cordelia is holding down two men at the moment, so she must have had a great personality or something. Cordelia also thought really highly of herself. She was constantly bragging about being photographed in over 100 poses. And her favorite pose was one with her hands behind her head and elbows out, which was so naughty for Victorian America. I mean, look at this. <gasps> I hope I don't get censored. That's some steamy stuff. No wonder John was smitten. After three years of keeping up this secret, John's wife, Mary Elizabeth, eventually catches wind of the affair and leaves him, taking her daughter with her. So now Cordelia is promoted to full-time lover and becomes estranged from her poor hubby, Welcome. At the time, Cordelia lived at the Victoria Hotel and when John's wife left him, he started running a room there so the two were able to be together often. As the secret lovers became closer, Cordelia started learning things about John's life, like the intense work he does as a reporter, the fact that his ex-wife, Mary Elizabeth, loves chocolate, and that they have a friend in the city named Mrs. Corbelli. And Cordelia is like, oh, hmm, fascinating. I'm just gonna remember that for later in case I need it. At some point, John's work told him that he was going to be the lead reporter on the Spanish-American War, and when he told Cordelia, he was like, hey babe, so I'm gonna leave for this big job, but when I come home, it's not gonna be to San Fran and it's not gonna be to you. I'm gonna go back to my wife and daughter in Dover, so sorry not sorry. As you can probs imagine, Cordelia was not happy about this. She immediately started sobbing, begging him not to go so they could keep living their best lives in the hotel. But he was like, nah, nah, I gotta go. And Cordelia lost her ever-loving mind. Cordelia immediately started writing these nasty anonymous letters to Mary Elizabeth, John's wife. She was taunting her, talking about how she'll never reunite with her husband, and said that he wasn't actually coming back to her after all. That summer, Cordelia went to her local drugstore and bought two ounces of powdered arsenic. To clarify, we will not be using powdered arsenic in today's recipe. We're trying to be here for a good time and a long time. Cordelia's friends talked about how she stewed in a jealous rage and how she was almost delirious with anger and sadness. And then they were like, oh, she also wouldn't stop talking about what it would be like to eat arsenic. Because if there's one thing Cordelia's good at, it's being subtle. Anyway, Cordelia hits up her local candy store and purchases a box of chocolates. She asks the girl packing the box if she can make sure the box is plain and to leave enough room in the box for a present. Then she goes to a store called the City of Paris and buys a handkerchief and gets to work. So Cordelia goes all Martha Stewart on this package. She makes sure there's no logo on it that could be traced back, no return address on the package, the works. Then she puts the lethally laced bonbons into the box, covers it with a handkerchief, and writes a note that says, with love to yourself and baby, Mrs. C. I hate to admit it, but that's a pretty good plan. I mean, when I get a box of chocolates, it barely lasts a night in my home. So homegirl really knew what she was doing with those sweeties. Out in Delaware, Mary Elizabeth Denning opens her mailbox one day and is surprised by a box of chocolates. Mary Elizabeth is like, yeah, my fave, and eats three pieces of chocolate before offering some to her sister Ida Dean and her two young children. If this was a horror movie, this would be the part where we'd all be yelling, no, don't do it, as we watch them all just go ham on these chocolates. Almost immediately, everyone who ate the candy becomes violently ill with stomach pains and some intense yakking. It was not a pretty sight. After two days of suffering, Mary Elizabeth kicked the bucket and all Ida could do was watch in horror as she slowly succumbed to her illness as well. Luckily, the children did survive because it sounds like they didn't eat enough of the chocolate to be affected, thank God. I guess Mary Elizabeth and Ida were too selfish to share more with them because, you know, chocolate is almost impossible to share with other people. So Mary Elizabeth's father examines the note and immediately recognizes the handwriting. 
He calls up the police and is like, yo, my daughters both just passed away from this sudden illness they got from these chocolates and everyone else is super sick. Then he's like, by the way, my daughter was also getting these threatening letters from some anonymous woman and the handwriting looks exactly the same. There it is, Cordelia, your fatal flaw. Should have typed it. Did they have laptops back then? Oh, I guess they had typewriters, right? Well, anyway, they have a chemist come and examine the chocolates. He confirms that the candy is arsenic flavored. So the hunt is on to track down the mysterious chocolate sender. The whole time this was happening, John was still away reporting on the war. One day, he was told he needed to go home immediately for a family emergency. You know it's bad when your job sends you home. So when John gets there, he hears what happened, sees the note, and knows immediately that Cordelia was the mastermind behind the operation. Then he starts to remember all the things he told Cordelia about how much his wife loves chocolates, how she lived in Dover, and had a friend named Mrs. C. So John is like... He gives the detectives a bunch of love letters from Cordelia and a handwriting analysis expert confirms that the notes were all written by the same person. Cordelia, honey, you've got to stop putting little skulls and crossbones as your dot in the eyes. It's getting obvious. So the detectives head out to San Francisco because they need to get Cordelia in custody as fast as possible. They were afraid that if word got out about them looking for her, that she was going to skirt right out of there. Within a few days, the detectives are able to find her, and when they do, she's just hanging out with her estranged husband and son. Oh, I'm sorry. You wanted to spend a little quality time with the fam, Cordelia? You know, I bet Mary Elizabeth would have loved to do that too. Just saying. As soon as they arrest her, everyone and their mother start coming out and being like, yeah, I recognize that lady. She bought chocolates from me, or she bought a scarf from me. And then the lady from the store looks at the box the detectives have and is like, I packed that exact box you're holding. But the ultimate nail in the coffin came from the postal clerk who assisted Cordelia when she mailed the package. And guys, this part is so cool. Get ready. He remembers her distinctly because his name just so happened to be John Dunnigan. So naturally, he remembered the box that was addressed to Mrs. John Dunning, since it was so close to his name. So yes, postal workers were still out there doing the most, even in Victorian times. God bless them. Well, after detectives had enough evidence on Cordelia to arrest and try her, they suddenly ran into a legal issue. So Cordelia's crimes were unusual because they technically occurred under the jurisdiction of two different states, and officials didn't know how to handle it. They'd never run into this problem before because technically Cordelia planned, bought, and assembled the thing in San Fran, but then the actual crime occurred in Dover. So it was like this weird, who gets it type of call that they had to make. After some back and forth between attorneys, it was decided Cordelia Botkin would stand trial in San Francisco like the true California girl she was. Cordelia was tried and found guilty of the crime in December of 1898. Then she appealed and was convicted again in a retrial in 1904 where she was finally sentenced to life in prison. And that was the last they ever saw of Cordelia Bakken. Or was it? Alrighty, so the judge who sentenced Cordelia was named Judge Cook. And Judge Cook had a late wife whom he'd often visit at the cemetery to pay his respects to. Apparently, one Sunday, Judge Cook is out to visit his beloved when he looks over, and there's Cordelia just straight up riding in a streetcar without a guard in sight, just vibing. Apparently, Miss Thang was out there trading naughty favors to the prison guards in exchange for a little bit of freedom. I mean, listen, I want to be mad, but at this point, I just have to respect the hustle. Like, this woman is just going for it, and honestly, she's got nothing left to lose. But Judge Cook saw that and shut that sh down real quick, so back to the cell she went. Cordelia spent a few years in jail at a small private jail in San Francisco until 1906 when the big San Francisco earthquake hit. At that point, the tiny jail was overcrowded, so they started relocating some of the prisoners to other places, which is when Cordelia found out she was going to be sent to live out the rest of her days where the baddest of baddies go, San Quentin. And yes, you are safe to assume that good old Miss Delia did not go quietly. Through her final years of life, Cordelia constantly begged to be paroled through every channel of means possible. And when that didn't work, she personally contacted the governor of California begging for mercy and to be pardoned. Well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of your own actions. So unfair. I mean, she only made one teeny tiny fatal mistake in a fit of jealous rage that cost two lives and ruined a family forever. What's the big deal here? 
While Cordelia sat in San Quentin, trying and continually failing to get out of prison, all the people she cared about started to pass away in rapid succession. First her dad went, then her husband, her son, and then John Dunning, all within a few years of each other. Naturally, Cordelia became depressed and her health quickly started to decline because of it. She knew she didn't have much time left and started trying even harder to get out. Some people hoped that losing someone closer would make her take responsibility for her actions or that she would maybe feel sorry for what she had done. But whether she was sorry for taking Mary Elizabeth and Ida's lives or she was sorry she just got caught, that's up for you to decide. On March 7th, 1910, Cordelia passed away in prison having only spent 12 years there. The cause for her demise was listed on her certificate as softening of the brain due to melancholy. She was only 56 years old. When newspapers caught wind of Barbarous Botkin's passing, they had a field day. The woman who once took the nation by storm would be on the front page one last time. Newspapers wrote that the final chapter to the sweet saga was over and that justice was served. Ironically enough, the courts were assessing her case at the time of her passing to decide if they should parole her or not due to illness. So that's super cool that the Grim Reaper helped make that decision a little bit easier for them. Thanks, girlie. But Cordelia Botkins wasn't the only Victorian lady to cancel someone by means of confectionery. Apparently, this was like a hip thing to do back in the day if you were the jealous mistress of someone, and there are multiple other instances of this happening. I wonder if there's a handbook you get when you decide to be the other woman, because these two stories are eerily similar. Like, there's this other Victorian villainess from the UK named Christiana Edmonds who was engaged in this secret love affair with a married doctor. I guess at some point the doctor decided to end things and Christiana wasn't having it, so she decided that if she couldn't have him, no one could. Christiana then went out to her local dentist to ask for some strychnine, which is essentially a pesticide. She said she needed it to take care of some local cats. Because you know how it was back in Victorian England. If something was slightly inconveniencing you, you snuff it. Then Christiana injected the strychnine into, you guessed it, a box of chocolates and gave it to the doctor's real wife. Unlike Cordelia's chocolates though, Christiana's strychnine sweeties did not get the job done. Christiana personally delivered the chocolates to the doctor's wife and although the woman became ill, she recovered a few days later. Christiana's ex-lover, the doctor, confronted her about the whole thing but she denied it, saying she even got sick herself. After that, Christiana just kind of snapped and started sending a bunch of lethal boxes of chocolates to random people with no rhyme or reason. Like, she even sent some to her own friends and family. Suddenly, people started dropping like flies across the city and there was this huge manhunt across London to find the evil chocolate sender. And finally, just like Cordelia, officials caught her when they were able to match the handwriting to some of the love letters she'd written the doctor. By the time they stopped Christiana, her victim count was up to six. Christiana finished out her days in an asylum for the criminally insane because no one could make sense of why she would send terminal treats to her loved ones. And I guess neither could she really. Hmm. Do you think it's possible that Cordelia heard of Christiana and was inspired by her fellow mistress in crime? I mean, I can imagine that Cordelia probably inspired other sugar-coated slangs as well, because there are a few more stories out there that are similar to this one. Not gonna lie, when I first heard about Cordelia Botkin's story, it sounded like the plot of a soap opera. When you've got ingredients like a secret affair, a jealous lover, and then you sprinkle in some toxic chocolates, you know you're in for a treat. I guess Forrest Gump was right when he compared life to a box of chocolates. You really don't know just what you're gonna get. That's why I'm gonna stick to my own chocolate treats from now on. I know they would never betray me. See you next time.